I think that when I was about six or seven years old, I found myself staring in the bathroom mirror, just like little kids do every now and then. But on this particular day, I was looking at myself, and after a while, there's this weird, uncanny feeling crept into the back of my mind. It was the question, am I real, or is the guy in the mirror the real me, and am I just a reflection? Two things sort of stayed with me ever since that day. First of all, a fear of bathroom mirrors in general. <laughs> but the second is a fascination with this question. How can we know what is real? How do we know how our perception reflects reality? And nowadays, it's actually my job to find an answer to that question. I'm an experimental psychologist. And that means that I do little experiments to test people's ability to sense the world around them. I study how we perceive the world. One of the great things about my job is that the world is one big laboratory. There are examples of how our senses play tricks of us everywhere. So uh, just as a general question, who of you has downloaded TEDx app for today? Uh, quite a lot of people, good. You will notice that the app has been sending you messages. But has it occurred to you that every now and then, you feel your pocket, you think that your phone is vibrating, you get your phone out and nothing has happened. Do you know that feeling? Yeah, it's very common actually. About 90 to 95 percent of all people have reported this once in their lifetimes. It's called phantom vibration syndrome. And <laughs> it's a real thing. It's a real thing. We, we do actual science on that stuff. Um, but the nice thing is, uh, it's just Another example of how your mind can sometimes make up things that aren't there. Uh, any young parents in the room, do you recognize the following situation? After a long day, you put your baby to bed, you go take your shower, finally some time for yourself. One minute under the shower, you hear your baby crying. Shower off, you run to the baby room, baby safe and sound asleep. Sound familiar? Shower schizophrenia. <laughs> it's a real thing. But I, I can tell you from my own experience, this passes. It's just a phase and it will go away. But again, a nice example of how your mind can play tricks on you. These are just examples of how it can happen in individuals, but we are, for psychologists at least, in a very interesting province. The province of Groningen, for example, has hallucinated a complete earthquake a while ago. It was about two years ago, actually, it was 4th of February 2014, about 9.30 in the evening. On social media, at that exact moment, messages started to appear, I hear this loud rumbling noise, I feel my house shaking, the paintings are moving on the wall. But the weird thing is, no earthquake at all. You know that all these things are registered, right? Especially with the natural gas drilling, but no earthquake has been recorded on that particular night. One thing that did happen, though, is that a jet fighter crossed the sound barrier over the Wadden Sea. That resulted in a low rumbling sound, but this feeling of your house shaking and, and, and the pictures moving on the wall, hallucinations. We hallucinate quite a lot, and that is actually a pretty normal thing. It's simply how our brain works. Our brain is not simply a passive machine that registers sensory input that comes in via the eyes and the ears. Your brain is a storytelling machine. It comes up with stories that nicely fit your present mental state. So what happened in this earthquake, for example, is that, well, you might remember that sort of two years ago was the peak of these earthquakes, and people were really afraid of earthquakes. So what happened is that people expected an earthquake to happen. They heard a low rumbling noise, so their brain came up with the story, ah, oh, earthquake. But one thing did not really fit the story, and that was that there were no tremors or no shaking houses present. Not a problem. Your brain makes it up for you. Your brain is a storytelling machine that can sometimes just fill in the details. And that leads to these mild hallucinations as phantom vibration syndromes, shower schizophrenia, and phantom earthquakes. In, in psychology and cognitive neuroscience, we call this the Bayesian brain hypothesis. And it's a big thing. Many people are studying it. And so am I. But a couple of years ago, it actually occurred to me that the way that we are studying this within psychology is a bit odd. What experimental psychologists like me do is that we get people into the laboratory, we put them behind the computer and let them do some kind of task. But 
That's not really how people work, right? Humans are a social species. We influence each other. I think that you all know that other people play an important role in your opinions, your thoughts. And about two years ago, I thought, well, wait. Couldn't it be that we also influence each other's perceptions? If our brain is this creative storytelling machine that takes information from the outside, would it also take the opinions of others? Maybe you know these experiments of social psychology, where you have three people coming into a room, let's call them Alice, Bob and Charlie, and they have to do a very simple task. So we got an experimenter and he's drawing a shape in the air. Simple, right? Now the trick is, Alice says, that's a square. Now Bob says, that's a square. Now what do you think that Charlie says? I mean, it's quite obvious I'm drawing a circle over here, but if we do this in a group setting, and Alice and Bob say, that's a square, Charlie is also very likely to say, I've seen a square. Now, traditionally in psychology, we thought that this is because Charlie wants to fit in with the group. He does not want to look silly. But couldn't it be that Charlie's perceptions are distorted because of the information he got from Alice and Bob? And that is what I tried to find out. What we can do these days is actually measure people's brain activity, measure their brain waves, and actually get an idea about what, we're see what they are seeing. So that's what we did. We hooked, hooked up Charlie to a brain monitor, monitors brain waves, and basically, much to our surprise, Alice says that's a square, Bob says that's a square, Charlie actually sees a square. His brain changes the perception of a circle to a square. And it's actually quite amazing. It means that a picture that we have in our mind, that view on the world that we think is so intimately private, is actually influenced by other people around us. What we see is something that we see together. Now, this is an example of people doing this together who are strangers. But what if you actually know the other person? That's actually what we're doing right now in the lab. We have couples come in, so now we have Alice and Bob, and they are uh, in a relationship. And I think that if you are in a relationship, that you recognize that you start to think alike about certain things. What we're now figuring out is that people are actually seeing the world in the same way as well. So again, we have the simple task. I'm drawing a circle in the air, and I ask Alice, OK, Alice, what do you see? And Alice says, square. Then it's very likely that Bob will also say, hey, I've seen a square too and not because he doesn't want to get into a fight with Alice. No, he says square because he actually perceives a square to be there. Again, an example of how people influence each other. To paraphrase Aldous Huxley, we've got the known, we've got the unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. The doors of perception, we open them together. Perception, seeing the world, is not a private act. It's something that we do together. That's a nice idea. It shows connection between people at a very, very intimate stage. We see things the same way. We share a reality. On the other hand, it's also a slightly dangerous idea for a scientist. Science is about the idea that there is an objective reality that we can know about by seeing it, perceiving it, sensing it. Seeing is believing, we say, in science. But what if you cannot believe what you see? I'll let you think about that particular thing over the coffee break. One word of warning about that coffee break, though. Coffee contains caffeine, and one of the weird things we found in our lab is that caffeine acts as a sort of amplifier on all these creative processes in your brain. So if you happen to find yourself talking to this really cool person over the coffee break, just keep in the back of your mind, it might have been a figment of your imagination. <laughs> Thank you very much.